Okay, hello everybody. I uh, want to welcome all of you across the world to this third Pinterest annual machine learning day. Uh, my name is Deepak Agarwal. I lead what is called core engineering at Pinterest. Uh, the goal of the core engineering team is to build all organic experiences that you see on the app. It's a full stack team and machine learning is of course a very important component of this team. As you know, our goal, one of the most important user problem we solve at Pinterest is to build personalized visual discovery experiences that help our users, who we call pinners, to move from inspiration to realization. And machine learning plays a key and very important role in solving this user problem. So I'm very glad to welcome all of you here. Uh, just to remind you, the highlight of this event is to bring machine learning talent across the board to highlight all the cutting edge machine learning technology that we have been building at Pinterest. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker. It's a it's great pleasure for me to introduce Chuck Rosenberg, who's going to be delivering a keynote or who will be delivering the keynote today. Chuck leads what we call the Advanced Technology Group at Pinterest. This is a group that is responsible for building very forward looking and cutting edge machine learning and computer vision technology. And the beautiful thing about this team is they're not only building next generation technology, they also make sure those technologies are used across the board in various different products that we build at Pinterest. They have a very successful track record. So you're going to hear all about that from Chuck and the title of his talk would be from inspiring machine learning tech to real life inspiration. Looks very inspiring to me. Uh, so cannot wait to hear what Chuck has to say in his keynote. Uh, let me also run through so the rest of the agenda for the day. So of course we'll start with the keynote speech that I talked about. And after the keynote uh, speech, we'll take a 10 minute break and then we, that would be followed by the senior leadership panel with a 15 minute break. And then we will have a series of lightning talk uh, followed by a technical panel. And then of course we'll end with some uh, closing remark. The uh, uh, topic for the senior leadership discussion would be the culture of innovation uh, that we have built at Pinterest. In, uh, in particular, how Pinterest builds machine learning empowered business solutions. The technical panel will discuss all the advances we've been making, making in deep learning to solve the pinner problem I was talking about earlier from inspiration to realization. So how, what have we done with deep learning to really help solve that pinner problem of helping pinners move from inspiration to realization? So yeah, that's, uh, that's it from me. And what I'm going to do now next is to hand over to Chuck. Uh, without further ado, Chuck, please take it away. Thank you, Deepak. Uh, great introduction, pumped up by all the inspirational possibilities and the music in the beginning. Um, so you saw my title from Inspiring ML Tech to Real Life Inspiration, and I'll dive in. One thing I wanted to say is feel free to use the comments to ask questions during the talk. 
um, we'll answer them at the end. We'll have some time for that. So moving on. Um, again, thanks for the great input uh, intro, Deepak. Um, I've been at Pinterest for four and a half years. As Deepak said, I lead the what we call the Advanced Technologies Group, or short for short, we call it ATG, right? And it works on advancing ML technology and its real world applications at Pinterest. Okay, so I first want to give you kind of an overview, of the goal of my talk, the TLDR. So really what I want to do is provide context for the rest of what you'll hear during ML Day, right? Really first in the form of an introduction to Pinterest itself. Um, I'm assuming if you're listening today, you have at least some notion of what Pinterest is, but I wanted to provide some important insights, which I think at first glance may not be obvious, right? And help set the frame for everything else that will come afterwards. Uh, and then I'll give an introduction to some of the ML work at Pinterest. And this is gonna be a broad overview. I don't wanna steal the thunder of the other talks later in the day. So you'll hear more details as the day goes on, as the event goes on. Um, and of course, this is from a little bit from my point of view from ATG, right? It's definitely not exhaustive of all the great machine learning work that's going on at Pinterest. So um, I know many of you may have heard this before, but I wanted to start out with it as we often do, right? Our mission statement, which is to bring everyone the inspiration to create you know, a life they love, right? But you, know, you may be asking yourself, what does that really mean? How do we do it? And what role does ML have to play um, in that? So you know, what really, really wanna say is that Pinterest is really unique and this mission statement really guides our work and is what has made Pinterest unique, right? Um, you know, we call ourselves a visual search engine or recently, more recently, a, an inspiration to realization platform. And so what happens is, is that people come to Pinterest, our users, which we call pinners, as Deepak mentioned, to find ideas, you know, such as, you know, recipes for dinner, they want to plan a birthday party or do some remodeling. They want to take some action, right? Um, and so that's very different than other uh, platforms. And really what, the, you know, what it ends up being is it's really all about the pin or the user. Our users tell us when they come to Pinterest, it's their me time. It's time for themselves, right? To improve their life to, it's not just mindless kind of scrolling, right? It really adds value, right? And that really leads to one of our core Pinterest internal corporate values, which is putting our users, putting our pin, you know, our pinners first. So let me get a little bit more concrete. Um, about what we mean about inspirational and action-oriented content. Um, this is a common example we've used before, you know, something like a search query for avocados, right? But it really very visually kind of drives this home, right? On the left, you see results from Pinterest for a search query avocados. On the right, you see from a standard search engine. Both results are really good and on topic, but on the right, you see it's mostly about avocados. On the left, on Pinterest, there's a lot more diversity, right? It's about what you can, things you can do with avocados, right? The images themselves are not the end, just the beginning of, they're just the beginning of the journey, right? They lead to recipes and how-tos, and that's what's really important and inspirational and kind of action-oriented. Um, I think as Deepak also mentioned, you know, what makes um, content inspirational is often that it's personalized, right? The, the system understands me and who I am. This may be a little bit of an unfair uh, illustration, but you know, um, this is a query for fall fashion. Again, on the left, results from Pinterest. On the right, results from the standard search engine. And Pinterest knows that I identify as male, so it really can give me photos of men's fashion instead of maybe the more common interpretation of fall fashion, which may be women's fashion. But we can you know, dive into a little bit of uh, a more subtle example. Right, um, you know, on the left, here the query is men's fall fashion. On the left are Pinterest results for, for my, myself, on the right from a standard search engine, right? And when I was using Pinterest, I was looking for maybe dressier fashion or maybe something that was a little bit more age appropriate. Our systems understand that and can personalize that inspirational content toward what's more, you know, personal, appropriate and inspirational uh, to me. So, you know, we start out with a sea of, you know, visual content, right? And I think really the, the key question is, is 
how do, can we use ML to go from the sea of inspirational content to something which facilitates inspiration? I think it's first useful to, again, break down a little bit more, you know, to add the context of what really is Pinterest, right, into the components, right? We kind of think of it, there's a, a bunch of pieces. There's myself, the user, the pinner. Um, there's the app itself, which has feeds of results. There's a pin, which is the basic unit of content, which is an image or video with metadata. And then there's what we call a board, which is a collection of pins, which is saved or curated by the pinner. And just to dive a little bit more into the Pinterest feeds, um, <coughs> excuse me, we have a uh, home feed, right? Which is kind of that query list experience when you first enter Pinterest. There's search, which is a text-based search for results. And then there's related pins, which given a particular pin shows you other pins which are related or similar to the pin that you're currently looking at, right? So you can kind of dive deeper into that. So how does this kind of play out? How big is Pinterest, right? I think that's another good piece of context for kind of the rest of the, the presentation of the day, right? Right now, we have more than 430 million monthly active users, right? More than 390 billion pins, more than eight and a half billion boards created by our pinners, right? And we operate in more than 35 languages. And in terms of what I mentioned before, in terms of people coming and getting value out of Pinterest, 91% of our pinners say, this is a place filled with positivity, right? So what this really means is that Pinterest has a very unique curated set of data at a massive scale, which captures how people describe and organize things, right? And that's just something very special and, and different. Okay, so diving in a little bit more about, you know, how do we <clears throat> out of this end up with something that's very, you know, inspirational and saves what we call pins are really a very powerful signal and part of this. So digging a little bit deeper, just to, again, kind of unwrap another level, right, of, you know, what is a pin, right? A pin, <coughs> excuse me, is an image or a video, right? It has a URL. It can have, it will usually have user-generated description of that content. Um, it can also have engagement information for how users have been using it, web crawl data, object attributes, right? So when people look at this pin, you have to remember that they're not really, they're interested in what the image represents, not necessarily the image itself, right? They're interested in the chair or the library room, right? But not just that image. And then the next concept, which is really critical, is the concept of a board, right? A board is a curated collection of pins which are saved or pinned by the user, right? And this is a manual curation process that our users do. And users can have often have multiple boards each with different topics, maybe ones about chairs or recipes or home remodeling. This is a very common behavior on Pinterest and saves are one of the things which really helps us make that jump to inspiration. And if you look at some results, um, I think it really drives it home, right? And that's in terms of the types of engagement you might see from saves or, or pinning, right? On the left is what you would see from videos um, which are looking at, you know, trying to optimize view time. And they're, you know, they're not that inspirational, maybe not that attractive, right? But they might engage people for a short time. Where if we take a look at the pins, the top pins by the number of saves, right? They really are things that users are saving for later, right? Is, you know, that they would like to come back to and take action on. And you could imagine those are things they found inspirational. And you can imagine that's a great signal for a machine learning system. Right. So given that inspirational signal, right, what can we, what can we do with that? Right. Obviously we can utilize that. Um, now just moving in, you know, I just want to say, but you know, as they often say on late night TV, but wait, there's more. Right. And I think another interesting thing about um, pins and boards is that the same pin can be saved to different boards by different people. Right. And this is what's illustrated on the slide. There's the pin on the, on the left and then three different, pinners save these into different named boards, right? One pinner might focus on the color, one pinner might focus on the vintage style or on the fireplace in and itself, right? This provides important information about the relationships between content and he, how people organize them. 
So besides that highly engaged signal from saving, now we also have this relationship between content on our platform. Um, so what can we do with that, right? This um, diagram kind of shows that in here, a blue circle is a pin and a red square is a board node. And we can make a bipartite graph out of that. And you can imagine pins that are kind of more connected together um, on this graph are more similar, right? So one way that we can utilize that and capture it is to do uh, a random walk. You can imagine on this bipartite graph and look at visitation counts, right? And we've actually done that and we've talked about it before. This is something called Pixie, but I think as folks know, we can, we've been, we've gone past that and we can do something better. Um, again, to set the context, Pin Sage, which is a graph neural network, is the next step in what we've done in this. And we've talked about this in the past, right? And what we've done is we've taken that pin board graph and kind of trimmed it down to something manageable that we can compute on which is a graph with 3 billion nodes, still quite big and 18 billion edges. And we still believe this is one of the largest of these types of systems in the world. And what you're seeing here is on the right-hand side is that every pin is represented by its connections <clears throat> in the graph, as well as a visual representation and embedding of the image or, or video, as well as a textual representation. And by putting those through a neural network, right, we now can get this multimodal representation of that pin, right, which can be utilized, it ends up being an embedding, it can be utilized by other systems um, at Pinterest, and also compare, you can compare two pins to one another. So we're really bringing all that, all the goodness of saves and pins and boards into the signal, single signal. And that's been, you know, really successful at, at Pinterest, right? We, it produces an amazing um, representation of content. We call the system, as you said there, PinSage. What you see on the left here is a offline eval plot, right? Where you can see that basically based on the random walk versus just the visual signal versus the textual signal versus PinSage, you know, how much better, this is a measure kind of of recall, how much better we've gotten, right? It's just a huge jump, right? And what we've ended up with is 70 plus launches across our platform, right? It's used in recommendation systems, features into trust and safety filtering and moderation, knowledge, understanding, shopping, advertising systems, just, you know, across the company, right? This really is uh, an amazing signal and that we can utilize in many different places. Um, so talking about ML for, you know, inspiration, right? Um, just want to kind of drill, drill down some places where it gets, it gets used, right? Um, you know, a key thing that we do with machine learning here is content understanding and representation, right? We're using ML to build representations of content on our platform, right? And also, as you see, we can use this to um, identify and understand the relationship between different pieces of content, right? And once we can understand these relationships and have a representation, we can start to do personalization and recommendations across the entire platform. Um, we can personalize what is shown to users to better match their interests and preferences. We can generate recommendations, which are more relevant. We can build ML on user interactions, you know, taps, searches, and of course, the very strong signal saves. And what I'll talk about a little bit later, we can also start thinking about, you know, visualization and content generation, which has started to become uh, another interesting and hot application for ML. Okay, so going through the list again, you know, I think a lot of these details will be uh, about some of these systems will be presented later in the event. So I just want to kind of, give you that broad view, right, of ML applications, you know, at Pinterest, where we're using ML, right? We're using it for personalizations and recommendations. That means, you know, ranking and retrieval in our various systems. We can model the specific interests of users for advertising. We can do targeting, targeting, pricing, understanding the relevance. We can do very specific content understanding of text, 
computer vision, and like in the case of PinSage, multimodal understanding. Um, we can use it for notifications, right? Understanding the content there and scheduling notifications, right? In visual search, we use this for Pinterest lens where you can search by camera or search using a pin. Uh, we've used this in inclusive AI, right? Where skin tone and hair pattern, you know, result diversification and filtering is, is achieved, right? And as I mentioned a little bit, I'll mention a little bit later, again, thinking, looking at creating new content, virtual try-on and in image composition. And there are many more, right? I think the goal here is to say like, you know, really ML is pervasive at Pinterest and we're using it across the board for many different applications. So what kind of modeling technology are we using? And again, I'm, this is just kind of a high level overview and you'll hear more detail later. Um, one of the most exciting and you know, useful pieces of technology we brought on board is transformers. We're using it in many different places, right? You know, neural network-based transformer systems. Um, we're using it in sequence modeling, content understanding, user understanding, computer vision, you know, embeddings for all those purposes, just really across the board. Every place we have used transformers, we're seeing you know, significant boosts, right? Um, as I mentioned with PinSage, graph neural networks are something which we have as a key technology. Um, also, real-time sequence modeling is important for really being having a responsive platform to user input and user interaction. Um, and what I'll talk about a little bit later is things like generative models and diffusion models, which are become very popular recently. There are things like two-tower models, of course, for retrieval multitask machine learning, and also looking at, you know, very large scale models with a billion or more parameters. Um, and as part of this, right, pervasive use of ML to really make it work, we need to have a modern ML infrastructure for this large scale ML applications and systems, right? Maybe you've heard Andre Kaparthi talk about software 2.0, where ML models are really this new basis of software, right? And I think it's something that we take to heart at Pinterest, right? And have worked to improve to allow us to be more efficient and really utilize ML in a more easy way when we can, right? Um, and to think about the scale, you know, we have more than an exabyte of data, right? At peak, we're running more than 400 million inferences per second. Um, so two things that, you know, I'll talk about this obviously does not cover everything, I'll mention is what we call the ML, ML end, which is our ML development environment. Again, there'll be more details about that later, right? But it's really a foundation for ML modeling across the company and democratizing the use of state-of-the-art machine learning, right? And as part of that too, uh, GPU inference has allowed us to get a hundred X speed up um, versus you know, serving to a single CPU. Um, obviously training these models is important and the infra teams, you know, have built out what we call the training compute platform to help um, with using, you know, more machines um, to distribute training. Um, we've also looked at building the a training, training data engine to mine more training data where it's needed. We've built out things like central feature, feature store, a unified feature representation and, you know, automatic retraining framework. These are all key components to having a modern ML system that can really be used and maintained and be production ready um, across the company. Um, there's an, this is another example I just wanted to bring up, right, as part of this, right, uh, which there'll be a deeper dive later in the event, but I just wanted to call it out here, right, to say this is work done in about the past year or so, right, and I think what's interesting about it is that um, it's had such big impact, right, so this is, um, what we call Pinterformer, which is better user understanding with uh, trans using a transformer and sequence-based modeling. And it's had site-wide impact of, you know, plus one or 2% time spent, three to 4% repins, you know, plus 1.8% revenue. And you have to imagine Pinterest has been around for quite a while. It's a very mature system. And the fact that utilizing new and better machine learning models at scale has had such a large impact, I think has been surprising to us all and shows that, you know, just the power of these systems and has made us, you know, want to continue to this work and invest more. Um, I also want to talk about, you know, the ML um, systems we're building, right? And the models, right? Is that 
you know, it's not just for our own internal consumption. We also publish and talk about it publicly. And we've had some really great, uh, you know, I think cutting edge results and resources, which has meant that, you know, we get some external recognition. Our inclusive AI work was recognized, uh, you know, especially for the hair pattern search was recognized in this past year by Fast Company. Um, and a bunch of the work we have done has been published in top tier conferences like KDD. So we're really trying to push the state of the art and get that, you know, out to benefit our users. Um, and of course, you know, I'm not going to go through all this, but there's a lot more going on. This was kind of only a very top level overview. You know, there's a lot of different, you know, different types of uh, content on Pinterest for representation learning, learning those embeddings. You know, there's work been work done on web mining through graph neural networks. Um, inspirational knowledge graph is being built out. Uh, you know, the two tower model and other types of learn retrieval. Um, you know, working on up. You know, what is the uh, predicting the uplift of notifications and using modeling and many more. So there's just Pinterest. You know, is using ML across the board for many different things. Um, so to change tack a little bit, <clears throat> giving all that. I wanted to provide, you know, kind of an exciting peek ahead to the next types of things that we're looking into, right? What's next for machine learning and uh, inspiration? So, um, you know, it's, as the title says, moving from recommendation to generation is one thing that's we're thinking about, right? If you've been following anything on ML recently, which I assume people attending this event have, uh, it's very difficult not to keep hearing about text to image. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, really this application of machine learning to things beyond um, recommendation, right? Generating content, <clears throat> excuse me. And given that Pinterest is a platform, you know, where visual content is key, right? Um, these technologies are really general purpose, purpose technologies and they're widely applicable, applicable to many uses, right? Um, you know, things like diffusion models, right? It really enabled many different possibilities in this space. And they're, you know, useful for much more than just text to image. Um, but in terms of text to image, um, these examples, images on this slide were based on some internal experiments on this space. <clears throat> but going to other applications, um, you know, in painting is another uh, type of technology um, that we've uh, experimented with, right? So in this example, in this page, you'll see images are paired up. The left image shows an, uh, kind of the main, the image grayed out with one object segmented out and selected, and the right image shows that object uh, inpainted or erased, right? That's what inpainting does. It tries to fill in the image with, you know, appropriate content, right? And <clears throat> these are based on generative models. <clears throat> Excuse me. These are based on generative models. And I think the really impressive part of what these models can do um, is really understand, you know, large structure of the images and patterns. Like on the bottom right, you can see that that wallpaper, you know, pattern is filled in when that object is, you know, erased. And you can imagine this is something that could be useful for our users if they're looking at home decor pins and they would like to, you know, erase or replace an object. Um, this is something that would be very helpful. Another application of the same kind of generative technology is fashion virtual try-on. And I wanted to show some experimental results. Um, here, the images are in triplets. The left image shows the original image. The middle image shows a piece of clothing on a white background. And the right image shows us transferring that piece of clothing onto the person in the image on the left, right? And again, same kind of technology, you know, at its core, trained differently. But um, I think especially impressive is the result at the top right, uh, where you can see that the person was wearing a long sleeve sweater. Uh, and then we're, they're now wearing a tank top and the model has to, the system has to generate their shoulders, their arms, and fill in those results. Um, and of course, we can't forget text to image. Um, here you see some low resolution examples of images generated, you know, from the text prompt below them. Um, some experiments that we've been performing. And I think, you know, one thing to notice is that this particular model seems to do a pretty good job 
uh, with text, which some of these models um, struggle with a bit. On that second to uh, last column on the right, on the top image with the mouse, you can see it says first day of school pretty clearly. Um, also interesting is the image below um, where the model has learned the Pinterest logo. So when we ask it to draw a Pinterest logo, it's able to, able to do that. Um, here are some more higher resolution examples. An image like the example on the left or the right kind of has more of a Pinterest feel, inspirational, aspirational, uh, how you might want to decorate your living room or a place you might want to, to visit. Um, another set of examples, uh, higher resolution on the left, you know, some uh, maybe some dessert you might want to make. <laughs> Um, and then um, on the right, you know, some cookies. Again, the model has learned about the Pinterest logo and is able to generate it um, as part of what it's doing. So I also, in honor of Halloween, which just passed, I had generated a bunch of images, uh, images of Halloween themed sweets. And I wanted to show them. You can see there's a lot of variety uh, and, you know, colorful and interesting. Uh, and imaginative things which uh, this particular model has generated. So um, I wanted to wrap up now, you know, um, again with this introduction, you know, uh, at the end of my talk and talk and, you know, basically bring out what I would say are the, the key takeaways, right? Um, one, the first is that, you know, Pinterest is really a unique platform, right? Um, our users, our pinners are coming with intent and seeking inspiration and want to take action, right? They find the time on the platform, you know, valuable. It's me time, right? They can plan for the future, right? And as part of that, they're saving and pinning, right? And this is a very strong signal about user interest, you know, intent, and as we showed, it's, it's inspiration, right? And this is a very, again, a very common behavior on Pinterest, right? We have more than 8.5 billion boards so that really shows that our users really lean into this. And, you know, that we get that kind of virtuous, you know, flywheel, right? Where we can help provide them with more inspirational content that's personalized to them, the more they save, and then they end up saving more. So I think that's really, you know, to me, super exciting and, and amazing, right? And the next part is that, you know, ML at Pinterest is really pervasive. Pinterest is powered by large state-of-the-art machine learning systems, right? You know, we have, as I said previously, more than 430 million monthly active users, 390 billion pins, and these 8.5 billion boards, right? And that is just a wealth of data, which we can use to make the system better for our users, right? And as you can see, it is a large a wealth of data. It's an exabyte of data, you know, and when we're running the system, you know, it's more than 400 million inferences per second peak, right? And, <clears throat> you know, and basically that data allows us to have these large state-of-the-art ML models deployed. And that means that we can train them and we've built the infrastructure necessary um, for training and inference, right? And I think as you, the last point, as you've seen in the pinner former uh, example, there's still a lot more to do, right? Anytime we keep deploying these systems, making them better, you know, our users react. And we've heard anecdotally even that, you know, people feel that the platform has become more relevant to them. So it's always really rewarding um, to see that. And with that, I will um, end my talk and I can take some questions uh, from people. Thanks. So, okay. How do we overcome the challenges of scaling such large models in production? Um, that is a good question. Um, some of it is, which I think you'll hear about later, um, is more frequent deployment of uh, GPUs more recently. Um, that really has helped us kind of for the same cost <laughs> and same latency serve a much larger model than we were previously with CPUs. So I think the one of the talks later in the day, we'll dig into that a bit more. Um, so maybe we move on to the next question. Um, 
Yeah, so we have the, the question is, you know, what's the metric on the y-axis on slide 22 comparing PinSage to other approaches? And how do you evaluate different ML models? It's always a challenge, right? Uh, you know, obviously the gold standard is the A-B test, right, online, right, where we can, you know, really run live traffic and see what happens. And we definitely do do that. But obviously during model development, that's not as feasible, right? Because, you know, we want to be able to iterate quickly. Um, so we've talked about some of those metrics. You can go to the, the PinSage paper and see. Um, some of those are, are recall metrics, right? Where we might have, the, you know, kind of the, the ground truth for, hey, when, uh, you know, the user saw this pin, you know, they repinned it. Um, and then we can kind of throw that into a big bucket <laughs> of other content and see how well the system, you know, ranks it and can retrieve it. So it's a matter, it's a measure of recall. Um, but it is always a challenge, right, to measure uh, ML models, right? Um, another gold standard is obviously getting data labeled on the fly, right? Every time you run an experiment, have some, you know, an offline experiment, have some new data. But again, that's going to be quite, uh, take time and be quite expensive. So building, you know, these kind of, um, building these offline metrics are really important. And, you know, over time, you start to learn what metrics uh, correlate with the outcomes, the live outcomes that you want to get. And those are the metrics that you'll end up using. Okay, Q3, next question. Um, so yes, we have uh, kind of centralized feature stores. Um, and we also have uh, this unified uh, feature representation. I think we've had some external talks about some of that. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to talk about it today, but I think, um, and again, my team doesn't work on that. It's more the, um, some of the other, uh, teams in the company. Um, so basically the, the thing there, one, there are kind of two pieces I would say is one of them is this, what we call this unified feature representation, which makes it easier for people to store features and share them with other teams and then having that centralized feature store, right? So kind of those two steps or what's necessary to, you know, facilitate feature reuse and storage, you know, uh, and reuse and sharing across the company. And that's super important, right? So not everyone has to um, re-engineer their features from scratch. Okay, next question. Um, so, um, I was not the individual on the team, one of the team and <laughs> the folks on the team uh, trained, uh, some diffusion models. Um, and, um, <clears throat> there are a couple of different architectures that are in use. Um, and I think some of them do a much better job at text than others. Um, so, um, we didn't do anything specifically to, uh, make text better, but I do think one of the things that if you take a look in the field, it seems like having a stronger text representation, you know, the, the text embedding does seem to help the system do a better job at generating, you know, more accurate and clearer text. So we are using um, quite a strong text embedding and representation, which I think is what facilitates that to happen. So I don't know if there were any other oh, questions. Um, yes, we are. We are hiring for full-time roles. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yep, we are, you know, always looking for great talent. Um, you can go to pinterestcareers.com for current openings. Um, you can also email keep in touch at pinterest.com you know, to keep in touch with our recruiting team. Next question. <laughs> The next question was, um, how do you handle that many images for recommendations? Um, do you stack multiple models to narrow it down? Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's a large corpus. Um, there are different approaches. Um, I think I won't go into in detail, but <clears throat> you know, we have different types of retrieval systems for our embedding based systems. We do have approximate nearest neighbor systems which can give us the you know, initial retrieval. And then like other, many other systems, you know, there's usually kind of a first there's a retrieval and then there's you know, different stages of ranking 
which occur, right? And that retrieval system is kind of an initial lightweight ranking. So, um, so since you could think of it as stacking multiple ranking models, right, to continually narrow it down, and you know, as over time, as you get fewer and fewer uh, results, those models can become a little bit more and more expensive, right? So you can get better results, better ranking results at the end, um, but you're processing fewer things, you know, at the end, right? So the cost is not as much. Um, <clears throat> Okay, next um, question. What are the general methods to construct um, the input GNN in Pinterest? Um, so I'm not sure exactly what that question is asking. Um, you know, one of the things, like obviously we can start with a pin board graph, right? We have those connections. You know, when a user saves a pin, uh, in a board that represents, you know, an edge between the pin and the board. Um, and then there's a question, which I'm not sure if this is what it's related to, is that there's a bunch of, you know, heuristics for kind of pruning things down, right, to make a smaller graph, right? And some of that could be on, you know, various types of things like, uh, you know, pins that have had less engagement, right, um, or boards that, you know, potentially seem um, less homogenous, right, in some way. Um, not everyone is uh, nice and organized at Pinterest or Pinterest users and creates nice labeled boards. Sometimes boards could just be a catch-all and there might be less of a signal there, right? Um, you know, people just keep saving everything to the same board, right? There's a little bit less of a signal. So I think that's one of the kind of things that we can, we can do. Um, next question. Um, I think that varies a lot per um, surface. Um, so I don't know if I really have specific numbers I'd share uh, right now. Um, you know, obviously it should be, you know, less than a second or a few hundred milliseconds, et cetera. Um, you know, obviously there are different systems which have different latency requirements depending upon kind of user expectations. You can imagine something like an ad system Right, you know, that's a large part of the ML universe at Pinterest as well. Um, has you know very tight latency constraints, right, to not delay the organic content. Okay, next question. So um, I think the next question talks about you know increasing content diversity, um, and there are. Um, different techniques uh, that we use. Um, so I think some of that will be discussed um, later, um, but definitely a common technique we use is trying to bring diversification, you know, um, into, the, um, into the final set of results. So a little bit of that is, you know, kind of um, after the, some of it is after the ranking, um, scores have been computed. Um, obviously, um, you know, we're working on various different approaches, right, to, to do this. And I do want to say another interesting component of diversification, uh, which if people aren't familiar with the feature in Pinterest, we have a skin tone and hair pattern filters launch. So, you know, besides the initial results being diverse, diverse users can also select for themselves and kind of narrow down to the set of results, you know, that are uh, what they would like to see. Okay, uh, the last question, um, which is, has Pinterest gained any benchmark tasks that have yet to be translated to gains in real world environments for those billion, billion nodes and edges? Um, gains in real world production environments. Um, I guess I'm not exactly sure I understand the question, sorry. Um, you know, obviously we have seen, you know, a lot of real world, um, real world benefits from our models, right? And these, this large graph neural network. Um, and so as we continue to tune it and enhance the content features and retrain it, and I think we'll talk about that later, you know, kind of continue to improving the ML models, we do really see 
you know, this is not just uh, an experiment, right? This is pervasive, used for quite a while on the platform, and we're continue, continuing to iterate and, and make improvements there. So I think, thanks for all the questions and listening to my talk. I think we're at the, the end of my part of the presentation right now, a part of the event. Um, I think we're gonna take a 10 minute break now and then come back with the senior leadership um, panel. Thank you everyone for joining us.